Hi, I'm Bex Roycroft, Senior Director of Global Operations at M3. Thank you so much for joining us at London Tech Week 2021. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to kick off the event with a discussion on the UK tech market and workforce strategies for success. I want to walk through the effect of COVID on the global labour market and how the UK technology sector is currently faring, some of the global workforce challenges we are all facing and how businesses can future-proof their workforce and start to tackle the problems. It goes without saying that since March 2020, the world hasn't been the same. COVID-19 pandemic disrupted labor markets globally during 2020. The short-term consequences were sudden and often severe. Millions of people were furloughed or lost jobs and others rapidly adjusted to working from home as offices closed. Many other workers were deemed essential and continued to work in hospitals, food retail, distribution centers and warehouses under new strict protocols to, re to reduce the spread of coronavirus. According to the latest edition of the International Labour Organization Monitor, 114 million jobs were lost in 2020, which in combination with working hour reductions within employment resulted in working hour losses approximately four times as high as during the financial crisis in 2009. The International Labour Organization estimates that the working hour losses in 2020 were equivalent to 255 million full-time jobs, leading to 3.7 trillion lost in labour income. The disruptions to the labour market were most pronounced in the second quarter of 2020, when further widespread lockdowns led to working hour losses equivalent to 525 million jobs. But by the end of 2020, as millions had returned to work or switched to working from home, the situation had improved significantly. However, the ILO does not expect that the global working hours will return to pre-COVID levels in 2021. So when we move closer to home and we look at the UK's recovery from the damage caused by the pandemic, we were lagging behind other big economies in the first three months of 2021. Economic output was 8.7% below the pre-pandemic levels at the end of 2019. And the UK's economy also stalled again in June amid the pandemic, which is related to the number of workers being told to isolate by the NHS app. However, all that said, there are plenty of green shoots and really exciting trends when you start to look into the UK technology market. The Tech Nation Report 2021 provides some excellent statistics to shout about and to get us really excited and to focus on the challenges ahead. For example, the UK tech VC investment is now third in the world, hitting a record high of 15 billion in 2020, which is amazing in the face of all those challenging conditions. The UK is also third in the world for investment into impact tech, which has increased 160% since 2018, while in the US, it rose by only 15% over the same period. As grand global challenges become more acute and awareness of them grows, it can only be anticipated that impact tech firms will continue to come to the fore. These companies are absolute pioneers with innovative solutions for sustainability, social inclusion, and fundamental human rights. UK unicorns are stampeding with seven more added to the UK herd in 2020. The unicorn class of 2020 includes companies such as Hopin, Gusto, Arrival, Kazoo, Gymshark, Infobib, and Octopus Energy, all who have reached the 1 billion valuation mark last year. And already by early March 2021, we have seen six additional UK unicorns added to their ranks. Starling Bank, Pat Snap, and Zago are just three of them. Bolstering the UK's already prime position in Europe, with more billion dollar plus tech companies than France and Germany combined. The UK startup and scale up ecosystem is valued at 585 billion, which is 120% more than in 2017. And more than double the next most valuable ecosystem, which is Germany at 291 billion. Jobs in the digital economy have risen by nearly 50% over the last 15 years. Since 2017, the rate of tech job creation has continued to pick up, and in 2019, it represented just shy of 3 million jobs, 
or 10% of the employed population. Tech jobs are a growing part of the labour market, but they also indicate what the future of work might look like over the next decade. The return to hiring was also coupled with a new breed of job descriptions. Some of these job titles are being advertised by the world's biggest tech companies, such as head of remote or remote work director. These could be the next big hiring trends as people like Facebook, Quora, GitHub have all advertised vacancies to look after staff who will never see the office. The World Economic Forum, who create the Future of Job reports, also provide some excellent insights into the challenges that we are facing globally. This is based on research across 26 major economies. The first major workforce challenge is adoption. The pace of technology adoption is expected to remain unabated and may accelerate in some areas. The adoption of cloud computing, big data and e-commerce remain high priorities for most business leaders. However, there has also been a significant rise in interest for encryption, non-humanoid robots and artificial intelligence. There has been double disruption to the jobs and labor market. The pandemic-induced lockdowns and economic contraction with mass working hours and job losses, as well as uh, the shift towards automation affecting skills at a rapid pace. Jobs are being destroyed and new roles are appearing. The number of jobs being destroyed are being surpassed by the number of jobs of tomorrow that are being created. Technological adoption by companies will transform the tasks and jobs and types of skills by 2025, and the time spent on current tasks at work by human and machines will be equal. The World Economic Forum estimates that by 2025, 85 million jobs may be displaced by a shift in the division of labor between human and machines, while 97 million new jobs may emerge that are much more adapted to that division of labor between human machines and algorithms. Skills gaps continue to be high as in-demand skills across jobs change in the next five years. The top skills and skill groups include critical thinking, analysis, as well as problem solving and skills in self-management, such as active learning, resilience, stress tolerance, and flexibility. On average, companies estimate that around 40% of their workers will re require reskilling, and 94% of business leaders reported that they expect employees to pick up new skills on the job, which is a sharp uptake from 65% in 2018. So the big takeaway from the UK market analysis and those global workforce challenges is that there is going to be a supply and demand issue. Currently, job creation is slowing while job destruction accelerates. Organizations will need to find ways to either generate new skills to fulfill the demands from their business or alternatively to repurpose the roles that are being displaced into in-demand roles within technology. So how do you do that? So there are two main pieces of the puzzle. The first is to generate new skills through emerging talent, and by that we mean generating your own pool of candidates that have specific skills needed to fill the skills gaps in your organization. And the second is through upskilling and reskilling. You can close the skills gap by unleashing talent within your own organization and reap the benefits of increased diversity, retention, loyalty, and reduced recruitment costs from internal mobility. So faced with the skills gap and a fierce market to hire experienced talent, organizations should adopt emerging talent as a strategy to build their own bespoke talent pools. So what is an emerging talent strategy? Emerging talent programs broaden opportunity, helping you build a pipeline of talent. They include graduate programs, apprenticeships, and early careers talent. They have a really strong focus on training, ongoing learning and development and support. And the main benefits are that it's a lower cost model to hiring in experienced employees or contractors. You can train them in the skills that you need to fill those specific gaps. And it's also an excellent way to diversify your tech teams. But why is diversifying tech so important? The likes of McKinsey and PwC have demonstrated the measurable value that diversity brings to a team representing diverse society that we operate in and the customers that we serve 
brings a greater number of ideas and a greater speed of innovation. Yet according to a report by Tech Nation, just 15% of the tech workers in the UK are from black, Asian and minority backgrounds. And only 19% of tech workers are women. So what's causing the lack of candidates from underrepresented groups? Earlier this year, M3 released the Diversity in Tech UK report. We surveyed over 2,000 16 to 24 year old young workers and business leaders. We found that 63% of businesses are aware of a continuing lack of diversity in their tech teams, and two fifths said that they struggle to recruit diverse entry level employees. Our report also looked into the reasons behind that shortage of diverse candidates, and I've pulled out some of our key findings. Firstly, a lack of encouragement in education. Only 40% of 16 to 24 year olds feel that they were encouraged to consider a career in technology or IT by their school. And disappointingly, this figure drops to just 35% of females compared with 46% of males. There's also a lack of inspiration for young people. Our study found that 17% of black respondents have been guided towards a career in technology by their parents, compared with 14% of white respondents and 10% of Asian. We might therefore find that promoting a wider variety of public figures from tech could have a tangible impact on the proportion of black students deciding to uh, consider a career in technology. There are a number of perceptions and misconceptions about tech careers. 74% did not think that careers in technology are likely to be amongst the most future-proof, even though our report showed that 92% of all businesses were hiring junior talent for tech roles in 2020. So what did our respondents believe the barriers are? Well, 31% of women are worried about their qualifications compared with only 26% of males. Therefore, encouragement and clarity on what is required and traits for success needs to be much more readily available. There are a wide variety of skill sets within technology, all with very different needs and skill attributes. We also looked into what businesses could be doing better and made some recommendations. So weeding out unconscious bias. Less than half, 46% of businesses currently invest in anti-bias training for managers, without which the risk of potential employees being unfairly judged however unintentionally, at the interview stages increased. Just 54% do not use neutral job descriptions. And even fewer businesses, 37%, anonymize CVs. Removing or potentially identifying information such as name and age and educational background makes it impossible for recruiters and hiring managers to make judgments about an applicant. Businesses also need to create an environment where diverse young people actually feel included. Shockingly, 82% of the young female black and African-American tech workers that we surveyed have felt uncomfortable because of their diversity. And we also need to broaden opportunity. One of my deep beliefs is that the great opportunities within technology should be for all. And of those businesses we surveyed, a third, so 33%, said that they exclusively hire graduates from top universities only and only 28% said that they consider applications from all universities equally. Now, the Russell Group universities have their own ongoing struggle to improve, improve diversity. For example, less than 4% of all of their students are black, compared with the UK average of 8%. So in order to achieve greater diversity at a junior level, businesses must actively work to widen their talent pool and publicize their roles to a bigger variety of people encouraging them to apply. So in summary, there are multiple benefits of emerging talent. By building pipelines of your own talent, you can broaden the opportunities to a greater range of educational backgrounds. Tapping into a more diverse group and increasing that size of the candidate pool that you're working with. And by focusing more on potential and less on prestige than universities that they attended. But solving the supply and demand issue cannot be met by hiring alone. Reskilling your workforce is a complementary strategy to hiring as it focuses on totally different pools of talent, your current employees. And the benefits of reskilling are absolutely extensive for companies. Reskilling is lower cost and lower risk than hiring as it removes the risk of a bad hire. 
And Tony Shea, CEO of Zappos, who went on to be bought by Amazon, once estimated that bad hires had cost the company well over $100 million. Employers will create motivated, loyal employees, increase retention, and increase brand perception. And employees with internal mobility are two and a half times more likely to stay than other employees. That tenure increases from 2.9 to 5.4 years. Therefore, in this graph from LinkedIn Learning Workplace, it's not really surprising to see that reskilling is a top priority for all L&D professionals globally. Reskilling is so critical to the success of the global workforce that the World Economic Forum has created a gigantic initiative called the Reskilling Revolution. Zadia Sahidi, who is Managing Director of the World Economic Forum, has said that by mobilizing industry leaders, government, international organizations, professional networking platforms, online and offline staffing firms, education and training providers, the reskilling revolution is aiming to provide better jobs, education and skills to 1 billion people by 2030. And some of the founding businesses are listed here and their pledges include Coursera, who is committed to upskilling 10 million global workers by 2030 in high demand domains of data science, technology, business and soft skills. And PwC will upskill each of its 276,000 people. And Salesforce has committed to help train 1 million people. So how do you create a reskilling and upskilling strategy? Well, there are a number of aspects and approaches to tackle this within your organization. Some more formal than others. So upskilling your workforce via a learning and development program is probably the most obvious way to go. And this entails analysis of training needs, for example, skills gap analysis, specification of learning objectives, design of training content and methods, and mentoring and evaluation. But job rotation is also a key technique in job redesign. This is the practice of moving employees between jobs in an organization. It can be an excellent way to transfer specific skills, knowledge, and competencies, and lateral moves are typically the most common. And job enlargement. This involves including additional activities within the same level to an existing role, more varied activities within a current job. And job enrichment is a process that is characterized by adding extra dimensions and levels to existing jobs. Examples include increasing the skill expectations, creating more autonomy, and giving feedback and increasing the scope and remit. And then there's peer coaching. That's another way to go about upskilling your employees. So two or more colleagues can work together to, among other things, expand, refine, build new skills, and teach one another, and also solve problems in the workplace. And then there's peer mentoring. And there's a distinct difference between mentoring and coaching in this context, with mentoring being with much more experienced employees who are teaching skills and knowledge to a less experienced worker. The mentor provides guidance. It can be formal, tracked, and against specific timelines. And then finally, you can hire external experts or uh, specialists in outsourcing. You can buy in people with the exact skills, competence, and experience that you need. And then by teaming these experts up with the people within your company, you can create an upskilling opportunity. And knowledge transfer can also be made a condition of the service. So what would be my big takeaway from all of this? Whilst the global labor market recovers from the pandemic, the UK technology market is experiencing a great deal of growth. The problems we will face to keep up with that growth are all aligned to those global workforce challenges. The pace of change and technological advances will mean that constant displacement of jobs and an ever-growing deficit in skills that are needed to replace them. Businesses need to act now to create their reskilling and emerging talent strategies to be able to outstrip the competition, the market pressures, and continue to grow their businesses. The opportunity is there, it just needs to be seized. Thank you for listening and have an amazing time at London Tech Week.